much and thanks for coming out. Um, in keeping with the theme of the, the series of talks, this talk was very much about uh, memories and memorialization of the First World War, focusing on a small area in County Tyrone uh, called Clockerney, um, particularly uh, Clockerney uh, Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's based very much on stories and memories of older men that I knew when I was growing up in Tyrone. Uh, very strongly it's based on stories that were handed out to me by my father who hadn't served in the war but his father had and his uncle had. So I was getting these stories and memories as I was growing up and I was taken to all these places uh, that were memorials or in some way memorialised um, the men from the Clockney area who had fought in the war. But of course the thing that came across very strongly, particularly as I got older, uh, I noticed when I was taken to these places is that an essential part of this story was that the men who were in the throne UVF before the war, who became uh, the Ninth and a Skilm uh, Fusiliers. And a lot of what I was hearing and a lot of what I was seeing, uh, the connection between the two organisations was inextricable, it was inseparable. Uh, and so this is where this talk, is sort of the genesis of this talk sort of began and where we're going to go today. So it's not purely about the war. I'm also looking at the period before the war because the two things are are, are, are totally linked and I suppose in a sense to sum it up what I'm looking at is really in Clockerty Presbyterian Church the transition of those men in that church and that belong to that congregation including my own family at that time who had been members of the throne regiment of the UDF and their transition into the ninth and the skills. There was others from the congregation involved in other uh, units but particularly today I'm going to look at uh, the link between the UDF uh, and the area uh, and the ninth and the skills. Um, my interest in the whole thing as I say, it stems from these memories and memorials. And of course, the first thing that sparked it off was this certificate, which was my great uncle's. This is a, the UBS certificate of proficiency of Robert Corbett, who was my great uncle, who I'm named after. Uh, and just at this stage, just to go quickly, I'd ask you to note this name here, T. H. Kirkpatrick, uh, and this name here, Philip Cruishank, who we'll talk quite a bit about these two guys this afternoon, because this certificate is sort of the focus of, of where this talk originates and what we're going to talk about today. I was given this when I was very young. Uh, 12, 13, uh, and that has sort of sparked off uh, my interest in this whole area. So it's my memories as well. So the talk is really a combination of local history, family history, and uh, I suppose even a bit of personal history. Those of you who don't know where Clockney is, uh, it's on the main home of the Balagoli Road. Uh, so, so from this end, it's from the Balagoli Doma Road, uh, about halfway down it. Uh, you, you go off to the right hand side. Uh, an area called Garden Clare and Clockney. This is over here, all the is down here. So it's in this area. So the main town of any side, oh, you guys are certainly you're from Belfast, the village, is Berra. <laughs> on that side, and over here, they did Fintan, but the village I grew up in, Seskin, over here. It's all in this area uh, of Mid Throne. Now, I will talk a bit broader than that area, uh, as we'll see as, as I go through. Uh, so the interest in the UVF came from the um, came from the uh, visit in this church, Stockery Presbyterian Church. Uh, that's what it looked like up until recently. It's just been demolished and a new church being built. But in my lifetime, that's that's what it, that's what it, what, it, what it looked like. And so my father used to take me here a lot as a young boy to see memorials in this church to some of the men we're going to talk about today, including his own uh, his own father, my great uncle, the man Robert Cord, whose name's in that certificate. And as I say, I was always very aware of the link uh, between the old UPF uh, and the ninth of the skills. And even today I'll show as the talk goes on that you can't look at one without looking at the other. There's a very still today a very strong connection between the two in terms of people's stories about the events at that time, but also in terms of what's, what appears in the memorials and where the memorials uh, where the memorials appear. Now my father had a very good reason for being interested uh, in the First World War and this period because his mother was married twice. He was a product of her second marriage. Uh, and the reason why he came along was because of the war. Had it been for the war, he would have been her tell off. Because her first husband was a man called Louis Mina. Uh, she had been born Catherine Anthony. Her first husband was Louis Mina. He had been a regular soldier and then a skills. He was on the reserve. He was a postman when the war breaks out. So he's away as soon as August 1914 when the war breaks out. He's called back up. He's still on the reserve. And he's killed at the Somme. Uh, on the 1st of July 1916, and then she marries after the war. Uh, my grandfather, William John Corbett, who we'll see in a second, uh, who, um, who uh, was also uh, at the war, but he was, in, had, was a civilian, he hadn't been in the army, he was in the 9th Service Battalion, one of the battalions formed under Kitchener's Reform uh, to create a, a large army for the war. 
that's Lewis Anthony's uh, will that was written at the front, leaving all his earthly belongings to his wife. He didn't have very much to leave, I can assure you. And this was just a little tree that he put up in his memory because he's uh, uh, it's part of the commemoration events that will happen and will be done trust recently. But this is my own grandfather, Brother John, who married Catherine Corp, to say she was from Mina. Uh, and this is where a lot of this research stems. So I had family reasons for being interested in this, and all our older men that I, when I was growing up who had served in the war wouldn't talk a lot, but would talk a little to me about it when I was growing up. Primarily the things that they said were things like, don't be obsessed with the song, think about Passion Deal as well. That one very much always stuck in my memory, and I think it was very incredible last year. But the thing is, I got older, as I started studying UBF at the university, and did dissertation at UBF at the university way back in the 80s, early 80s was then there was this conflict of loyalties that was taking place. So we've heard a lot of talk uh, about the conflict of loyalty within Catholic nationalist people backgrounds. But the same conflict of loyalty was taking place within unionism. Because before this, the photograph was taken on 21st of March, 1914. And that particular weekend, it looked like the government was going to move uh, against the UVF and Ulster. The UVF saw it as the Ulster plot, the attempt by the government to coerce the UVF. This photograph was taken in uh, Oma the very same weekend outside St. Columbus Church. Along here you have members of the Skillens and members of the Bedfordshire Regiment. The Bedfordshire Regiment had actually been drafted in to Ulster that weekend in an attempt to regain control, I suppose, to a certain extent. And this is the UVF here. This photograph belies the tensions that existed at that time. It was Ulster at that stage of the Bearded Civil War, I'm not sure. But certainly the signs didn't look didn't look didn't look good. The peacefulness of this movement belies the tensions that were taking this this time. I came to this view, you know, made famous sort of by a very prominent historian, David Miller, you know, this is a concept of the King's Rebels here, the UDF, potentially maybe end up being involved in conflict with the, the army, uh, then join up uh, uh, to the King's Colours as part of the, the Ninth and the Skills. And that belies uh, the, whole, the, the whole sort of story. So what I really want to do is use this certificate uh, to talk about uh, that transition of these men from Clockerney from the UVF uh, area to become the, involved with the Ninth and the Skills. We'll talk about, about the development of the UVF there because I think that's very important for how things stand out later uh, and look at how these men are commemorated in the area. So as I said that is the gentleman who the certificate belongs to. We've, unfortunately we have no photographs when he was young uh, but it was been very clear that these certificates were only to be given out, uh, they weren't to be given out broadcast, they were to be given out uh, to men who were efficient. The UBF was making an attempt to have their men prove that they were efficient because this myth that they were all efficient is a myth. <laughs> and these were simply for government to try to encourage men to attend drawing and go to things that were not to be given out broadcast. But for our purposes they tell us quite a lot. They tell us that they belong to the Tyrone Regiment, the second bit, Tyrone Battalion. Uh, and again, the officer plan his company was Thomas Kirkpatrick and the officer the band of the Italian was Philip Prusak, we'll tell you about in a moment. I want you to keep those two ideas in your head. And he was, obviously they were trying to get them efficient in drill, shooting and signaling, but appeared they concentrated mainly on drill and shooting, and that would appear to be, uh, quite, to be quite normal. Um, that's my grandfather, who was also involved in UVF, was also a member of the Congregation of Clockwork Presbyterian Church uh, at this time, and was also involved uh, in this company here, of the company UVF. They trained, the drill centre was at Clockerney, it was very close to uh, the Clockerney Christian Church that we just looked at there, but the actual name of the company was Berra, though some people also refer to it uh, as Clockerney. And this is then um, a photograph taken that I got from a local doctor in the area, who was a very prominent local story, Dr. Mitchell, Aldine Mitchell. And we'll cover these photographs of the actual company at company level, the RH company of the second battalion. So it's good to actually have a photograph of the actual company that we're, that, that we're interested in. It's of course, you're all aware that the, the Ulster Covenant, that the men who signed the Ulster Covenant had said they would use any means necessary. Uh, here again we have Robert Corbett, he couldn't write, somebody had signed their name, hence the X. And Thomas Kirkpatrick, uh, the man we saw who would only be his company commander in the UBF, and we'll hear about it in the ninth and the skills later, signing the Ulster Covenant together. Uh, and then this is my grandfather here, who couldn't write either, uh, signing, somebody signed his name from William John Corbett. Of course, the UVF, uh, as we all know probably, was officially established on the uh, 
31st of January 1913, that was publicly announced and established, but it had been going on, uh, drilling had been going on long before that. Uh, the first big public appearance that receives any attention was at Craig Adam House at one of the Monster Unionist demonstrations uh, on the 21st of September 1911, but recent research by the like of Alvin Jackson and people have shown that the drilling and importing of arms was at least going on from, from late uh, 1910, and that certainly is the case uh, in, in Tyrone. There was a police report that we looked at in Tyrone was showing that uh, by February 1912 there was 1,399 men in Tyrone uh, receiving training at 29 drill centres. Uh, they had to get the authorisation of a GP. That was absolutely no difficulty because lots of the men who were involved in leadership, who will, some of whom will talk about a minute, particularly uh, Captain Ricardo, were GPs, and they could authorise this drilling. And this is 12th of July at 1912 at Barnscourt, the home of the Duke of Aberthorn. And here we see men take part in the drill competition. They were men from North Tyrone, but men from Mid Tyrone acted as pickets for them. So you see very evidence of, of drilling taking part in you know, six months, seven months before the UVM is officially established. But the main thing I want to say about this is, is that the pattern of, of the UVF um, drilling levels is not consistent. There are variations across, uh, across uh, uh, Ulster. Uh, now, the same example, Cloudy uh, Derry, Cloudy Derry, uh, joins Cloudy Tyrone. At the very same time that there was uh, 1,399 men receiving training uh, in Tyrone at 29 drill centres, there was only uh, 200 men receiving training in Cloudy Derry at three drill centres. Uh, and people have wondered why these variations are. Uh, and I, my view is that the throne was much further ahead uh, than, say, for example, Cody London, because at this time in 1912, the first talks about partition are then referred to as exclusion, but it means the same thing. We're very much about uh, where throne and Fermanagh would sit within that, uh, because throne had a, a majority of Catholic population. So if you were going to have exclusion, and what counties of Ulster were going to be excluded, thrown from Manna with nationalist, uh, so Catholic majorities were very much in the balance. The rate of recruitment in drill centre in Fermanagh was also low, but I think that's because the, the uh, population, the Protestant population, the population in Fermanagh was considerably lower. Whereas in Tyrone it was very close, it was about 55% nationalist. Uh, and I think Tyrone were really making sure that they were putting up a strong representation of these drill units to say, you know, we're not going to accept this. And if another talk I talked to the UVF there were, I could go on more length with that. But I think that's the, the principal reason why. But the main point for here is, is that even before the UVF formally established, these men are receiving training and they're receiving it in across the county. Decisions taken to form these local volunteer units into uh, the one central command organisation known as the the Ulster Volunteer Force in the end of January 1913. This was the enrolment form. Very, very simple enrolment form, but the fact that they had an enrolment form shows the organisation behind it. So your name, your address, your profession, your age, all the sort of things you would, you would expect. That, that takes place uh, at, that, at, at that time. At the end of uh, you know, December uh, 1912, beginning of January 1913 with the UVS form, you know, it's, it's estimated that there's 15 companies uh, drilling uh, in the Oma area, which is quite a lot, you know, uh, uh, and there's one mounted through, but uh, we're constantly in the drilling companies. Uh, so there's quite a lot happening at that time before the, the, the decision is, is taken. The decision is taken to form them, the, it was very much based on a, a county structure, each of the counties of, of Ulster were divided into a county division, and depending on the numbers of men they have drilling, they formed uh, a variable number of regiments, Tyrone, it was decided would have one regiment, the Throne Regiment, which is divided into five battalions. It's very much organised along traditional British Army lines of regiment, battalion, companies, sections, squads. Uh, and I suppose maybe some people have made, Tim and Bowman in particular, have made comparisons between it and the Territorial Army, which was being for a Territorial Force, which was, being, which was founded in, uh, in uh, GB in Great Britain um, uh, just a few years, a few years earlier. So it's a very traditional army approach. Uh, a lot of, as we should see, there's a reason for that too, and the fact that a lot of men involved had been in the British Army. And, and of course, the commanding officer that was elected for the Tyrone Regiment is this gentleman here, who was the third Duke of Aberfarn. Uh, hence why you saw them using the grounds of Barnes Court. The Aberfarn family uh, were very much uh, involved, <coughs> excuse me, uh, were involved, were involved in that. And the headquarters for the Mid-Tyrone Battalion 
uh, was in Oma, 33 Market Street. And just very quickly, in the other battalions, just to give you an idea of the structure, where um, North Tyrol, based around the Straban area, Mid Tyrol, based around Oma, uh, uh, Dungannon was the 4th Battalion, based around Dungannon, the 5th Battalion was Cookstown, and the 3rd Battalion uh, was South Tyrol, based around that Clocker Valley area, Upper Clocker, uh, and Five Mount But we're looking really at, 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 at Mid, at mid Tyrol and, and that Oma area. So the Duke of Abercorn was the the commanding officer of the whole organisation in Tyrone, but the main driving force behind the movement uh, was a guy called Captain Ambrose Ricardo. He was the county adjutant, he was involved for responsible, his full name was Captain Ambrose and Quentin Ricardo DSO. He was born in uh, England in 1866 uh, at Gatcombe, where, the, where Princess Anne lives uh, now. Uh, and he joined the army uh, in 1888. He became a captain in 1897. He was in the second battalion, the Royal Scotland's Fusiliers, uh, and he served in uh, India and he served in the South Africa, Second South African Boer War. Uh, some people refer to that, 1899 to 1902, and he received DSO uh, in 1900. And he is a very central figure to this story. He retires, as we shall see. He retires from the army in 1904. In 1893, and what brings him to throne is that he marries Elizabeth Alice, who was the second daughter of Emerson Tennant Herdman, who lived at Simon Mills, the Herdman family uh, that owned the, the famous lemon mill there. And he becomes a director of the lemon mill uh, after he retires from the army in, in 1904. And this man is, is, is central to what we're really talking about here. He, as we'll see, he goes on to play a leading role uh, in the Ninth and the Skilns. But if we go back to the certificate that, is, that sort of motivates this talk, you remember I said that the, it was signed by the battalion commander, who was Philip Cruishank, who later becomes Captain Philip Cruishank, but we just referred to him as the top title, the name Philip Cruishank. Um, Cruishank was appointed the commander of the second mid Tyrone battalion, the battalion that the Clockney men belonged to. Uh, he's an interesting character too, uh, because he's not from here either. So we have an Englishman now, we have a Scotsman. Uh, he was a journalist. Uh, he was born, uh, in, we think, uh, in Aberdeen in 1882, and he was a journalist by profession, and he was sometimes worked on the Aberdeen uh, Daily Journal. But in 1903, he comes across to Austin to take up the job uh, with the Daily Standard, and then he moves to Oma to be the editor of the Tyrone Constitution in 1905. And he immediately becomes very involved in things in the Oma area. He sets up the Boys' Brigade in the town. He's a member of the First Oma Presbyterian Church, but he's also very much involved in unionist politics. Uh, he becomes a member of Oma through Blues Lodge and a member of the Masonic Lodge in Oma. He stands for uh, the local council, the Oma Urban District Council elections in 1908. He was unsuccessful. But whenever the also unionist uh, council starts to reorganise itself with the eminence of the Third Home Rule Bill in 1912, he takes a very leading role and the organisation of the Ulster Unionist um, uh, organisation in the Oma area. He's its secretary. Uh, he's very much involved in organising these local volunteer drill corps that I mentioned that there was 29 of, uh, sorry, 29 drill centres and almost 1,400 men uh, receiving training in 1912. He's the secretary of that and he organises a huge visit of Sir Edward Carson uh, to Oma in 1912. He's involved in organising the volunteers who went from Tyrone, who made such an impression at Craig Avon in 1911, who made such an impression that some of the early histories, including Tony Stewart's book, basically says this is the beginnings of the UVF, but we now know that's, that, that's not the case. But there was a thousand men went from mid Tyrone to that demonstration uh, in Craig Avon. And he was responsible for Shank for the organisation of the Ulster Covenant uh, in the Oma area. He was a born leader, uh, and he used journalistic skills to publish pamphlets uh, against Home Rule as well. This is a very influential man, much neglected in our area in Tyrone, starting to change that a bit. But you've got to remember that by January 1914, a year after the UVF was officially set up, he's responsible for over 1,600 men uh, in the UVF at that time. By that stage, the UVF is estimated over just over 8,000 men, and uh, nearly 1,700 of them are in the, the mid-Tyrone area. And of course, this is the structure of what he was in charge of. Uh, this is the UVF Tyrone Regiment, second of the Tyrone Battalion, focused on the Oma area. And there we have him here, Philip Cruishank, at Camps Road Road Oma, and as I said, he was a journalist. And below him then there were uh, 15 companies. 
And one of which was the one I'm particularly interested in, uh, the Lafferty uh, Company, which is up here. And here we have, for the certificate, the company commander of each company, Thomas H. Kirkpatrick. And then there were four sections, and the Duke of May, I may have mentioned it, may not, but Corbett was in section four, Duke Corbett Brothers were in section four, and there's their section commander with the guy called Robert Benton, and they're relatives of Robert Benton, and I'm speaking to them not very long ago, another event that was talking about are still living in that area. So there's a reason why people are interested in, in this, type of, this type of thing. And this is Thomas uh, Kirkpatrick himself. And he was the, the company commander uh, of the UDF uh, in the Bear Hour Clockerty area. In 1911, we know he was 28, uh, and he was living with his two uncles on a farm uh, at Clockerty, which confusingly is also referred to as Deveroy, but it's, 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 the, it's the same place. It's one of these country things. He was a leading member of Clockney Presbyterian Church, which was the church that my grandfather and my uncle, that both of us belonged to, as I've said. Active member in Berry LOL 796. And just note that he was a founder member of the Sons of David Royal Black Presbytery 405, because we'll see how important that is in terms of ongoing memorialization in uh, a wee minute. And Kirkpatrick was the company commander. He was very much responsible for organizing uh, the UVF uh, in, in, in the, in the Berry area. And it's hard just to estimate how many men he was responsible for exactly, but I would put in the region of 100, uh, maybe just slightly over 100, uh, that, he was, that he was responsible for in four sections of, of the Barrow UDF. And a lot of these men are like Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick's a farmer. In fact, farm labourers in particular, which Robert Corbin was and William John Corbin were, they were farm labourers. Farmers are overrepresented in the UVF, but in particular, Farm labourers are particularly overrepresented in the ranks of the ordinary UVF rank and five. So Kirkpatrick's farmer, the Corbett boys, as they were then, were farm labourers. This is the photograph that was on the screen when you came in. Very fortunate. This is what uh, H Company, Zach, Ty, UVF, Berra, Clockerney, in other words, looked like. Probably taken early 1914. If we were in Clockerney, I could take it to the field. It was taken. It was very close to the Church of Ireland Rectory uh, in Clockerney. This is another picture of them with their bicycles. Whenever I was doing research on the UVF, I liked him going there in the 1980s. I, was, I, was, I thought the UVF were obsessed with lists after lists of do you own a bicycle and can you ride a bicycle? Of course, then I found later on a manual from the British Army more or less asking the same questions. And then I, was, I was 19 and knew it all. But then, of course, the penny dropped that uh, this was the easiest form of transport in 1914 because not everybody had the money to afford a horse. And this is then outside. Uh, the church friends were actually at the end of this week, knocked down and we built. Uh, and this is them with their bicycles, which are the mobile forces, how they described themselves uh, in, in 1914, probably July 1914, I suspect. But the majority of these men, like Patrick, had never been in the army. Abercorn, the top, the commanding officer, Ricardo, the adjutant from St. Mills, they had been in the army, as I've just described. Uh, Abercorn had been in the, uh, in the lifeguards. Ricardo would be in the second of the skills, DSO. The majority of men like Patrick and the Corbett's hadn't, so the UBF uh, had a lay on training for them, which was done in Orange Halls and Church Halls. And then, and you know, the Timothy Bowman in particular has shown that while the attendance was good, it would be wrong to say that it was perfect. There were evidence that you know, it was hard to get men to go drilling, it's hard to get men to come to a talk, never mind to go drilling. Uh, so, what they were better at attending was these big parades. And they held, this is one here they held in a place called Crevin at Home in Oma uh, in February 1914. Massive big parade. This was a review of the whole battalion. Very, very you know, big uh, event. You know, well over a thousand men at this. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, but it was really to give the men, sort of the uh, never served in the army, to give them some instructions. But they went further than that. They developed uh, two camps of instruction. UVF organized camps of instruction all over Ulster uh, during the sort of late 1913, early 1914. But the very first one anywhere in Ulster uh, was this camp of instruction that took place at Barnscourt in October 1913. It was 300 men, opposed to the 4th of October 1913, 400 men, consisting of 300 company commanders and some sex leaders to receive instruction and drill and musketry. And not content with that, uh, they organized a further one. Uh, on the 30th of May to the 6th of June 1914, which 926 volunteers attended. So these are big, big uh, 
uh, camps of instruction. Then that model was copied uh, across other parts of, of, of Ulster at that time. But the Tyrone ones were the first. The second one in, in, in June, you, know, you had battalion staff, company commanders, section commanders, drill instructors, signers, scouts, quartermasters, cooks, Red Cross corporals, stretcher bearers. I recently did a talk in Barnsford about this, and these two events are nearly something of talk uh, in their own way. Of course, they were taken seriously as an army that were saying that they were going to resist uh, home rule uh, by armed force if necessary. They needed slightly more than bicycles. Uh, this is them at Barnes Court as a separate event in July 1914 with bicycles. And this was the Kendall State They're actually carrying rifles. Because after the, the Larn Gun Run in April 1914, they are better armed. But let's go back a bit to before the gun running. Sort of the best estimate that I can come up with was that before the gun running, um, they had about one rifle for every 12 men. So, and of course, the ammunition they had and the rifles they had were all of varying calibers and all the rest, so it was going to be a nightmare. After the gun running, it goes up to about 5,302 rifles, is the best figure I can get, uh, which is about one rifle for every other man that was in the organisation by that time. So, one between two, they had about 10,000 men. Uh, so, it's one for every two. But again, the problem is there are varying calibers uh, and varying makes. You're going to have a lot of what one historian has called a logistical nightmare if hostilities did begin. I'm quite often asked what would have happened if hostilities began. Could they have taken on the British Army? The answer to that is in a full scale, long term situation, absolutely not. But they did have enough sort of uh, rifles ammunition that they could have given an RIC station, uh, a small unit of the RIC, considerable bother for a short period of time. And of course, the big issue was where they're going to come into conflict with the Irish volunteers who by July 1914 there was at least 5,000 of them thrown uh, as well. That's a discussion for another day. So the, the men who were in the clock in the area uh, belonged to the H Company of the 2nd Mid Tyrone Battalion and they could be seen as the King's rebels prepared to resist the wall of the Liberal government uh, to bring in home rule. Then the war breaks out uh, in August 1914 and many of these men, but not all of them, many of these men um, sign up for the 9th uh, in the Skilln Fusiliers. It's a service battalion. Before the war, the Skilln Royal Skilln Fusiliers had two battalions of regular battalions, of course the second battalion. But in the, after Kitchener's great appeal to create this mass civilian army, you have these what are called service battalions formed for the duration of the war. And the first person to really get involved in this in Tyrone was uh, Ambrose Ricardo, who I showed you a picture of earlier just as plain Ambrose Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo Carson, of course, offers the UBF, you know, he does a bit of negotiating before he, they finally get uh, the UBF uh, as a separate uh, battalion, a uh, separate division ultimately. Uh, but Ricardo was not prepared uh, to wait. Basically, and as soon as war breaks out, he goes to Omo Depot, which was the depot of the second Royal Skilling that he had belonged to himself uh, up to 1904. And he immediately sets about forming two new battalions. Uh, in advance of Carson coming to an agreement with the, the War Office. But whenever that agreement is reached, it is decided that the Tyrone uh, UVF would form the core of this 9th Service Battalion, the Royal Scale and Fusiliers, and it really owes its origins to Ricardo, who had been the county adjutant of the UVF in Tyrone, and he encourages uh, the men who had been in his Tyrone UVF regiment to join up. He becomes its first uh, commanding officer, and initially he's promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, he goes to France with them, he serves with them, at the, very quickly here I'm doing this, he serves with them at the Battle of the Somme, which was their first major, major engagement. Uh, and then later on he's promoted to Brigadier General, he, he, he leaves, gets promotion, promoted to Brigadier General, and he ends up commanding uh, the 109th Brigade, of which they also have formed a, a key part. Uh, but this is the man, if you're ever going through St. Mills, you will see a... Uh, uh, a monument outside the Church of Ireland Church where he's buried outside the church. It's very much part of the memorialization of Ricardo. Uh, and this is his funeral, a picture of his funeral. He died suddenly. He was drowned in 19 July 1923. But Ricardo, when I was growing up, I heard about the Clockerty Boys. And you heard about the member of the Church. But if we were going through Sion Mills, you always heard about this link to Ricardo. Ricardo was very much seen during the, before the war, during the war, and after the war. Is very much the embodiment of the ninth and the skill and fusiliers, and very much uh, the driving force of, of, of what they um, did. And even after the war, in the immediate years after the war, when it came to events at the end of the war about uh, set up the British Legion, uh, 
but having events where they weren't demobbed, the 19th Battalion weren't demobbed in 1919, officially June 1919, and all the events that were taking place in Ome at that time, Ricardo is very much the front face of it. He's the, he is the face of what was happening. As I mentioned, the commanding officer of the Tulum Regiment had been the 3rd Duke of Abercorn. He didn't go to the front, he was involved in recruiting. Uh, so I'm not going to say very much about him himself, but you do hear these comments made sometimes about you know the lions and the donkeys being the lions being led by donkeys. Just be careful about those sorts of things. Uh, Abercorn was probably too old to go, but this is his brother, uh, Lord Arthur John Holland, who was a regular, who was a regular soldier. He had served in the Irish Guards before the First World War uh, and was in the army and had come out. Was in the reserve. But as soon as the war breaks out, he rejoins the guards and he's killed near the uh, age 30 on the 6th of November 1914. So although the Duke of Abercorn himself was too old, this brother uh, was killed serving, another brother uh, served as well, Claude, uh, and he's highly decorated actually, later, later on, he received DSO, uh, he survived the war, and his sister was killed, uh, she was Lady Phyllis, she was killed in RMS uh, Leinster when she was sank on the 10th of October uh, 1918. So although I'm concentrating very much here on, on the rank and file, um, you know, we need to also remember that those people high up in the society in Throne were also uh, taking part in the war and, and making that sacrifice. But returning now back to the 36th Division where I want to go really, as Lord Arthur Hamilton's uh, Commonwealth War Grade Certificate. Returning to the 36th Division, one of the myths that I've sort of been trying to dispel, I know, I know this audience will be aware of it, but the number of people who think the 36th Ulster Division went to the front in 1914 is remarkably high, of course. They didn't leave Belfast until May 1915, uh, and they don't go to France until later in, in 1915. But taking it back to Flockerney, uh, this is from the Roll of Honour that the Presbyterian Church compiled, a really useful book uh, that they compiled after the war. And this is all the men from Flockerney who took part uh, in the First World War, served and were killed. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on this group here, I'm going to concentrate them on. But you'll notice over here how many of them are ninth in the skill fusiliers. Most of these men that I've been able to track were all in the UBF before the war. Uh, and so, <coughs> excuse me, so there's 26 there altogether, and 17 out of them uh, served in the 9th Battalion of the Royal Ennis Skill Fusiliers. Uh, and of course, here you've got the two corps that a mistake there. Uh, George and William John, which is just like all other sources, there's mistakes in them. And then that's the Robert Covey's UBS certificate I showed you earlier, which really begins with my interest in all this. And there is Kirkpatrick, who was the company commander. And that's Kirkpatrick I really want to turn to first here. Uh, that's what Clockery History and Church looked like in 1902. Uh, slightly different from the photograph I showed you of it, what it looked like in my time. This is the church that the Corbett's and the McKittricks uh, and the Kirkpatrick's all belong to. So one of the first to recruit from the, to, be, to sign up from the uh, company of the UBF was their company commander, uh, Thomas Kirkpatrick, and he becomes very quickly becomes a sergeant and then he's made a company, company sergeant major. And he set sort of the example of the rest of the, the unit uh, from Clock and the UBF uh, to follow. Uh, and very interesting because we've been able to trace bits and pieces about what they got up to. When I was very young, uh, one of the older men that I was spending with, uh, who was at DCM, told me that the 9th Battalion of the uh, Enniskillens took part in the first raid of any significance that the Ulster Division undertook when they went to France, uh, and uh, that was May 1916. So in other words, things were happening before the Somme. But he was quite proud of the fact that Throw men, particularly men from Clockney Rose, men from all the parts of Throw Valley, taken part in this first raid uh, by the 9th Battalion of the Enniskillens and the uh, for the Ulster Division as a whole. Now, I always treated it with a wee bit of scepticism, even though I knew he had uh, DCM and that he was awarded it roughly around this time, but I always kept a note of it. Working on the Nugent papers here when I was an archivist and also work done by uh, Nick Perry on the Nugent's correspondence I have now confirmed that, can confirm that that story of their memories is correct because the first significant attack by the Ulster Division took place on the 8th of May 1916 not on the scale of the Somme but the first significant engagement, you know, of any note 
was on the 8th of May 1916. Uh, uh, out of which uh, ultimately nine were killed and 22 were wounded. And of course one of the people wounded was their company sergeant major Kirkpatrick from Clarny. Hence why it was so much in the memories of these old men uh, uh, that I knew. And I also then established that another man who's in that Clarny rule of honour uh, called William David Watson was also killed on the same night. So the stories that they told me were correct, I was able to verify, very strong. They didn't talk a lot, but the bits that they told you, I was able to match up. And uh, this is Kirkpatrick's grave in Commonwealth War Cemetery in, 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 in France that we went to, that we, that we, a couple of us went to visit a couple of years ago. And uh, this is his, also his colleague from Clock and UVF in the night of the skeleton, W.D. Watson, son of Bella Watson, Donald and I, Barron, who was part of, part of Clock and Parnish. So, Kirkpatrick, the company commander of Clogany, and W.D. Watson, we see them very clearly taking part in this first action. Uh, and then it goes on further in terms of memorialization. Within Clogany Presbyterian Church, that church I showed you there, they put this tablet up to Company Sergeant Major Thomas Kirkpatrick, 9th Royal Skillings Fusiliers, who was killed in Flanders on the 7th day, 1916, 34th year of age. But these are the bits that I mentioned earlier and the reason why this talks about the UBF and why I emphasise the Royal Black Perceptory. It was erected by the Brethren and Comrades of the Royal Black Perceptory and the Ulster Volunteer Force, Ninth of the Skillings. So in the memorials there's a direct link between all these organisations and that's why this talks about the, the, links, the, the, links, the links between them. And more than that, uh, he was, I told you earlier he was a member of Berra Orange Lodge. In 1932, they decided to build this building here in Orange Hall, which was opened in 1933, and they called it the Kirkpatrick Memorial Hall, opened in 1933, in memory of him. There's no longer an Orange Hall, a number of the local Orange Lodges have ceased to exist and have been amalgamated into one. But they took the, this building has now been sold, uh, it's no longer there, uh, it's going to be a new house probably built on it. Uh, but they took the plaque off the wall and they took it and put it in the, the orange hall that serves as the hall for these amalgamated orange lodges. Again, just to emphasize that this memorialization still continues and how the links of it continue through. This is a relatively new banner that uh, Devroy, sons of David Royal Black Assembly 405, which Kirkpatrick founded. They unveiled a new banner a couple of years ago and they decided that on the front of it would go Thomas Kirkpatrick. Now, most Royal Black Deceptive Banners only feature religious um, scenes, both on the front and back. Orange banners tend to have some to do with King Billy on the front and <laughs> some to do with religion on the back, and they carry, it, carry their way around. This is very significant for a Black Deceptive to have on the front, you know, uh, Kirkpatrick. It just shows the, the, the extent of that link in the memories uh, uh, in the area. Talked a lot about Krushank, so I want just to talk a bit about his uh, service then. He was, as I say, the, the company commander, battalion commander of the Mid-Throne Battalion of the UBF throne before the war. He's a journalist of the Throne Constitution, takes on that role, and he obviously leads the way uh, when Ricardo sets up or tries to set up these two uh, battalions. Uh, he leads in just over 100 men and to sign up uh, in Oma Barracks. Uh, for this uh, sort of uh, embryonic uh, new battalions. Uh, he goes in as a private, but he very quickly uh, becomes a captain, uh, and he's killed at the Somme on the 4th of July 1916. And there's an, an entry, obviously, he's the editor of his own constitution, so whenever he's killed, they give him lots of coverage in the paper. I uh, just quickly read what I would say. They published a letter from an NCO in, his, in one of his companies about uh, his death. Uh, I'll just read it quickly. He got up close to the German wire, and like the good soldier, he was, rose up and waved his men on without him. He was one of the best men soldiers I ever met, and God rest his soul, and helped his mother to bear the trouble. I, I, every, even now, I see him on the parade, I see him on his white horse, I think he was one of the finest men who ever glorified the king's uniform, and no man, no man died an older death than our poor captain. So he was obviously very highly thought of uh, by his men. He has no known grave, he's on the faithful memorial to the to the missing uh, at the saw and that's printed off just from the Commonwealth War Graves. We try to increase awareness of who Krushank was because of the fact that he was a Scotsman, that his family has no family connections with Oma anymore, his family connections with Scotland. Uh, he goes to say to work in Derry Standard in 1905. So we try to just do a bit of awareness work around him. Glad to say the man that started us all off and I was named after 
Uh, he survived the war. He was wounded a couple of times. Uh, my father always said he never saw his shirt off because he was machine gun across the middle. Uh, and he never ever in the hottest day ever saw him with a, with a shirt off. He always kept it covered. In terms of memor memorializing uh, these men from Tocqueney, they decided that the way to do it, of course, wouldn't be Christian Church, but didn't have a good argument, but before they decided what they were going to do, about the fight. Um, they decided that the best way to memorialize the men who served and were killed uh, was a, a, an organ, uh, and this is the organ here. Uh, it was dedicated on the, the Sunday, the 9th of November, 1919, and all the men are listed there. There's William Corbett, Robert Corbett, uh, Patrick, I might need to go to the next particular week. We screwed the we screwed the lamp off to get a better photograph. The Patrick's there as well, I just can't see it. Just at the mouth of the Belt of Order, I'm sure. There he is, Paul, Thomas Kirkpatrick. Along with three other men, the William Watson, who was killed the same night as Kirkpatrick, died a few years later, of course, who was wounded that night. And Robert Rainey and John Rainey, who are very well known members of the congregation. In fact, one of their descendants is Alan Rainey, who sits on the Oma District Council still. That's Robert Rainey. Uh, so other members of the congregation. One person maybe I should mention just in passing, uh, sometimes gets forgotten about is the clergyman here, the Reverend J. M. Patterson. Uh, John Morrow, James Morrow Patterson. He uh, excuse me, he came to Clopity Church in 1905, and he was there till 1926. Uh, but uh, for six months in 1916 he got special leave of absence from the presbytery to go to serve for the YMCA in France. And that's the whole area that needs to be looked at, it's just all these people who went to serve for the YMCA, particularly clergymen. Uh, but what's it interesting with him is when he was away from the, from the congregation, there had to be another uh, Presbyterian minister that pointed in charge, and the one pointed in charge was a certain W.F. Marshall, living at the Lister fame from Six Mile Cross, who, to put it colloquially in their own speak, was up to the UDF to his hoozle <laughs> as well. So he was replaced by very much uh, very much uh, one, one, one of his own. Coming to the end, just to conclude, uh, this is the first exalted event uh, in the next time of the Skelms of their D, final D mob on the 14th of June uh, in 1919, uh, parading down what we would know as the courthouse hall uh, in, in Oba. Uh, Ricardo, who by that stage was already home. Uh, was very much involved in organising uh, the final um, demob for the occasion of the 9th Battalion in, in, in the town. But I think what really ties what I've been trying to talk about together is two plaques uh, that still uh, are in St. Columbus Church of Ireland Church in Oma. We had the colours that went with them up until very recently, but they no longer have survived as the ages that were not properly preserved. And Age has overtaken them and the, the deteriorated and no longer exist. But these two plaques beside each other in the church sort of sum it up. The first one is to the officers and non commissioned officers and men, it's the second to their own regiment of the Ulster Volunteer Force. Afterwards, the Knights of the Tide and the Royal Ulster Fusiliers, who fell in the Great War in 1914 to 18. Very clear link between uh, the UBF pre war times. Um, the 9th Battalion of the Skelms during the war, and immediately below it then the King's Collar of the 9th Service Battalion brought out Skelms Fusiliers. This battalion was raised in the Petro in September 1914. And I say the main person who was behind that was Captain Andrew Ricardo of St. Mills, who was the, was, the, was the county resident. Thank you all very much. <laughs>